Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Edge, Operations Manager at Cox Edge, and welcome to the September episode of our monthly webinar series, The Future of Edge. In this series, we ask questions about what the future will look like and what you can expect to encounter six to 12 months from now in the world of edge cloud and edge computing. Today, we're asking, can you move to the edge securely in 2022 and 2023? Apps in the traditional cloud are being moved to the edge to be closer to customers, closer to where data is generated. And data that is used to be kept on premises or in private clouds is being moved off-prem to the edge to take advantage of the lower TCO and other reasons we'll get into later. So with all this movement and relocation happening, is the edge secure yet? Is innovation outpacing security? How is the network actually secured from an L3, L4 perspective? How are the economics of security changing? Is moving data closer to the source increasing or decreasing the attack surface? We have those questions and a lot more to cover, so let's get started by letting our guests introduce themselves. This month, we're talking to Shyam Krishnaswama from Deep Fence and our own Kavita Parihar. Shyam, welcome. It's great to have you here. Can you tell everyone about yourself and Deep Fence? Thank you for the warm welcome, Hannah. Hello, everyone. For those of you who just joined in, uh, I'm Shyam, CTO at Deep Fence. Uh, we, we have been with Deep, I've been with Defense for the uh, last couple of years, since its inception, actually. It's been a pretty exciting year so far at Defense, where we have had sufficiently interest, increasing interest in our open source offering, where we have got been lucky to define some new categories, which I will explain and I will touch upon as we keep going on through the course of this webinar. Awesome. We're glad you're with us today. And this is our first time being joined by our own Kavita Parihar. Hi, Kavita. Can you tell everyone about your role at Cox Edge and what you're working on right now? Thanks for the warm welcome, Hannah. And hello, everyone. Uh, for those of you who are just tuning into this webinar, like Hannah said, my name is Kavita Parihar. I'm the Director of Technology and lead all system integration efforts for Cox Edge. I have been with Cox for almost three years now. It was a busy year for us, and I'm sure for every one of us. We have really been focusing on building our core expertise, expanding our suite of products and services, and improving the whole user experience. So lots of interesting stuff is happening in the edge tech space. I can already tell this is going to be a great discussion. I have a lot of questions queued up and ready to go, but let's start with one I asked at the top of the session. For both of you, is innovation outpacing security? Um, I can go first, and I would say uh, significant technological advances are being made across a range of fields. Information communication technology, clearly, but also artificial intelligence, particularly machine learning and robotics, plus nanotechnology, space technology, and biotechnology, and quantum computing. Now, these breakthroughs are going to be highly disruptive, and we all know, and they bring about major informative in shifts in how we look at security functions and how these innovations could pose serious challenges if we don't stay focused on them. Plus technology enabled innovations are getting more complex and interconnected. So they are getting harder to manage, harder to patch and update. Some of these have come from different vendors or different teams within the same company, and they have to interface or integrate with technologies from other company. Now this has led to an independent heterogeneous architecture and a need for a standardized and integrated operating approach and development of more industry standard and the creation of other mechanisms for managing all of that. Now, if that wasn't complicated enough, data in these systems have also grown. It's more and more difficult to maintain one master record for core data elements like customer, employee, rate plan, vendor, and pretty much everything else. Today, it's normal for this data to be spread across multiple systems, which are located on different networks in different countries, crossing borders, and often being left to interpretation. On one hand, it's great that we are in the world where data is so easily available. On the other hand, there is a growing community of hackers and criminals who are just taking advantage of the same technological advances, and they are continuously innovating at a very fast pace. So, yes, Innovation is always about to outpace security. It is very important that as we innovate and advance the tech, we also make significant investment in security, all of it. Application security, infrastructure security, cybersecurity, privacy, and no one wants to slow down on innovation. So the best approach is to bake in security instead of bolting it on later. And that is very important. 
but easy to overlook. So we need to make sure we have right governance, oversight, and control in place. I would say it's a paradigm shift. What do you think, Shyam? Well, that's a very interesting viewpoint, Kavita. Uh, let me try to answer it this way, right? Let's put innovation into two buckets. This is first bucket where innovation happens inside the computers, the software and the hardware. So that's how we end up creating computer chips with billions of components inside them, or very really clever ways to squeeze out the maximum performance. So the other bucket is where computers enable the innovation. Like for example, we saw some really interesting images of how black holes are going to look like, or advances in gene therapy. Traditionally, innovation and security have not had this kind of a gap that we now see in modern businesses. Innovation in modern businesses, whether it is in the technology world or where technology enables the business, is moving faster than ever. I mean, I've been looking at the brick and mortar stores that embrace technology in a very rapid way, right? To make them very digital aware and things like that. They build an application. They deploy this application in Amazon Cloud. And there is a recommendation engine for this application that uses ML. And so that gets deployed in Google Cloud. And there are some other, what you call components where they get deployed on Azure. Multiple clouds, right? Modern businesses are building applications and they're not worrying about the infrastructure that's needed to deploy these applications. The advances in methods to build and deploy applications have started to pose some really interesting questions around ways to secure these applications. Why? Because it's now a lot more vulnerable to hackers. The attack surface, as we call it, increases simply because applications are split into multiple components with each performing one task. And that's a fact of life when you have your applications in a distributed model for maximum efficiency. Now, for us to minimize this gap between innovation and security, the security tools themselves need to adapt to this modern businesses. A very easy way and a very perhaps a very logical way to do this is to start thinking about the application itself. Why? Because traditionally, security always started at the network layer. But what if, what if we start thinking about security from the application layer, right? Hmm. That's an interesting point. So how is the network actually secured from an L3, L4 perspective? What security considerations are specific to the edge? So, um, uh, Hannah, I would say from L3, L4 perspective, the attacks target the network layer, which is layer three, and transport layer, which is layer four, not the application layer, right? Now, Edge is protected against these attacks by network firewall, intrusion prevention system, and DDoS prevention tool that find and block malicious activities. Now, because the network connection to the Edge is the conduit for all edge information and all the operation practices and messages it is very critical that the network connection be fully secure. Now that means high quality encryption that avoids storing keys on the edge system. You do not store keys on the edge system. That's less secure, we all know. Multi-factor authentication or a carefully controlled physical security dongle should be required for all network application and operation access. And edge computing resources that use Wi-Fi should be on their own separate Wi-Fi network with measures to ensure that others cannot get the password and log on. Now, all of this, whatever I have said, right, has to be monitored, logged, and audited. All deployments, configuration changes, and accesses to any supervisory mode from either a local keyboard screen or remotely must be seen. Ideally, you also want to ensure IT operations and security know about changes before they happen, and that there is an escalation process to notify management if anything unexpected is reported. Now, Shyam, I recently read a blog post on Packet Streamer by Defense, uh, which is providing network layer observability, right? So it looks like yeah. your team is doing some great work in this area. I would, I would really love to get your perspective on some of those security challenges. Indeed, indeed. So thank you, Kavita, for uh, giving us the commendation that you did read the blog post. Uh, interestingly, uh, that is a big contributing factor to the whole network layer observability, as you already observed too. You spoke about security considerations specific to the edge, right? Now, let me add a little bit more pers perspective around it, particularly in the L3 and L4 layers. 
Now, just a few moments ago, we spoke about innovation and security. With innovation and security space, we believe we should be able to add runtime context to the L3 and L4 layers. When I say runtime context, for example, let's take a well-provisioned firewall or tools that monitor and block access to resources or to servers within your infrastructure, right? These tools, we believe, can perform much better if they have additional information about the application itself, like a spike in resources used by application or increased number of connections to the database, right? With this type of additional context, we believe a firewall in the L3 and L4 layer can be programmed to block an incoming network connection that causes high resource usage. This is the innovation security tool space where the L3 and L4 layers are enhanced with information from the L7 layer to provide a comprehensive security. I'm going to invite members of this webinar to please go over to our GitHub and take a look at the packet streamer that Kavita spoke about. It's quite a nifty tool that gives you additional ways to understand what's going on with your L3 and L4 layers. Shyam, does that mean the economics of security are changing? That's a very interesting uh, question, Anna. Uh, I would say that yes, economics around security are changing, maybe in ways we don't even fully appreciate until lately. Now, even with the best of security tools, organizations get hacked. They get hacked all the time. And they're forced to pay. Either they pay money or they pay with downtime or they are restoring backups and hardening their security or pay with loss of reputation. Well, I would argue that in these situations, the security tools available were not used properly or there were no security tools at all. But I'm going to leave that discussion for another day. But once a security tool has been identified, right, there are some costs involved to get the maximum benefit from it. The most common scenario that we've seen from our experience here is security tool teams are understaffed. We believe in those cases, the security tool needs to provide maximum support to the security teams instead of being a tool that requires high maintenance, right? I'll go, I'm going to illustrate that with a simple example here, right? Vulnerability management. Identification of vulnerabilities within any application deployed in the infrastructure, in my infrastructure, in our infrastructure, is clearly an important part of your security posture. But if I have to improve the economics around this whole security business, right? We would expect the tool to do something about these vulnerabilities, right? I mean, the users of security tools do not like to see this long laundry list of about thousands and ten thousands of vulnerabilities, right? A little while ago, there was a lot of chatter about automatic remediation, but that kind of quickly died down simply because of various inherent risks. But what if the security tool could be innovative here and provide a way to prioritize those vulnerabilities, right? Something like, hey, user, here are the vulnerabilities that can actually be targeted for attack. Why? Because your application is loading this library that has this vulnerability. So go and remediate that vulnerability. And here are some ways for you to do so. So by being innovative here with some simple, clever techniques, tens of thousands of vulnerabilities come down to a few hundreds, right? I would say that security economics is indeed changing. The tools are expected to be creative. They are expected to augment the under-resourced staff instead of needing an army to maintain it and extract value from it. What do you think, Kavita? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Shyam. And so before I answer, you know, Hannah's question, I would I, I want to ask you, do you have that tool in mind? I mean, are you guys working on a tool that can um, help solve this problem, right? What we have been talking about? Well, uh, Defense by itself, we provide a tool, Threat Mapper, that helps you to prioritize these vulnerabilities. We introduce a notion called Attack Graph. 
the most important thing here is this tool is completely open source. We believe that open source by itself should not be treated with disdain or contempt. Open source should be treated with respect. And we have provided certain additional, uh, what you call value add on the on top of certain commodity based tools. Commodity based tools are scanning. We have been able to add this whole runtime context on top of it. And that is what is we believe being innovative here and giving back to community. Awesome, awesome. That that's great. That's great, um, Shyam. And I'm sure uh, all of our audience are going to check out, you know, Deep Friends, what they do, what kind of cool tool it is. Uh, now, going back to Hannah's question, Hannah, um, the worlds of software development and IT have changed tremendously over the last two decades, right? You know, software development evolved from a slow and rigid waterfall model to the more flexible and agile approach of DevOps. IT organizations evolved from using slowly provision on-premise infrastructure to the fast-paced environment of the cloud. Now, due to this shift, cybersecurity professional has to adapt to the change. The shift from DevOps to DevSecOps is the most recent example of that adaptation. Right? Now, like I said earlier, now shifting security to the left is the new norm. I believe in that, right? The, the operational work of the security testing has to be moved from the dedicated security teams to the developers. It's not just the job of InfoSec team, right? So, so that they can integrate security testing results quickly. Now the question becomes, you know, how do you achieve this? If I have to say, you know, I, I, I can say that uh, number one is integrate security into existing work patterns. Number two is select the right tool to streamline the process, like what said Shyam. And number three is to educate developers on the foundation of good software security. Now, this is very important. They have to have a strong knowledge of common cybersecurity issues and how those might appear in their work. They also need to understand the secure coding practices that will protect them from these common vulnerabilities. Gotcha. So would you say moving data closer to the source is increasing the attack surface? And if so, can security observability keep up? Well, I'm going to answer that one first, Kavita. Permit me to do that. Yeah. Right? I mean, edge is more in your playground, but there's a very interesting point here about security observability. So please let me take that, right? Now, uh, moving data closer to the source does increase the attack surface. True but it also offers a very interesting perspective. Now, as long as we are able to deploy a probe that stays close to the source, does not add any latency, it stays away from adding anything to the underlying operating system, we will be able to get some really valuable data about the source itself. Now, this means the traditional observability models that we used to have, right, where I want to understand what goes on with the system, it can be enhanced with additional data about the source itself, meaning are there new processes coming up? Are there new network connections coming up? That kind of data, right? Those are the triggers that we can use, be innovative around them and provide security. Security observability becomes possible with just being a little bit innovative here, we can easily define security observability and defense excels in that being able to do security observability at a scale that is not known to now. Security observability, we believe, becomes a way to reduce the challenges with the real challenges that involve the ability to monitor my attack surface and protect it from the attacks. So security observability is no more useful than becoming it's any ability to keep up and things like that. No, it's, it's, it's a little bit more different here. Yeah. Kavita, you're doing product development for the edge, right? What are you dealing with these days? So um, I would say moving data closer to the source um, brings a lot of advantages, right? But it also means the attack surface is affected. So we have to be very sure we expand the data protection out to the source of the data, not only at the destination like we used to do before, right? How do you do that? Observability is the next big thing in security, like what you said, Shyam. You need something designed to protect the system, not only at the destination, but also at the source. Also remember that cloud providers will only monitor their own services. You will need observability of all your security workloads, whether it's on-premise, hybrid, or cloud, and that requires you to either create your own solution 
or find a security vendor to support a single source of truth for observability. And this includes the entire software development lifecycle also. But with the right architecture and tooling, you can have end-to-end -end security and observability. You just need to consider all aspects when you are designing for security observability. And that, that's, that's my perspective. Sure. OK, I have a new topic. Everyone everywhere has been affected by the supply chain over the past couple of years. And logistics is one of the areas where edge adoption has been speeding up. What is changing with supply chain security as edge adoption accelerates? Kavita, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, the supply chain is something, you know, you take for granted until something goes wrong, right? Like what you said, Hannah, yes. the, pandemic, the pandemic highlighted just how quickly business can grind to a halt if the supply chain is disrupted. Organizations have seen edge computing making the supply chain run more efficiently. By moving the edge requires a new approach to supply chain cybersecurity. That's because edge computing brings a lot of real-time visibility to the supply chain. Companies can now monitor equipments and operations and make immediate decisions. Basically, you see more and more reliance on IoT and industrial IoT. Now, Gartner says that by 2025, 5% of the enterprises will rely on edge computing, which is huge. But as that dependency rises, so do the security risk. Supply chain generates a lot of data that can lead to the wide-ranging attack surface. Organizations need to think about cybersecurity layers to secure the edge. Now that starts with an assessment to determine your risk level and to identify any missing gaps. The security layer for the edge environment should be an extension of your own current cybersecurity solution. If a zero trust strategy is in place for enterprise network, that should be extended to the edge. You need to understand the risk associated with edge computing and recognize the appropriate controls for mitigation. And all your stakeholders need to be involved in this process, educated in their role in your security. That should prevent threat actors from disrupting or taking over supply chain or business operation. Interesting. Shyam, what do you think? Uh, well, Kavita spoke about some very, very interesting points around supply chain issues in the edge world. But I'm going to take a small detour here and speak about supply chain issues in the software development and deployment world. Now, there are plenty of statistics to show that open source software is a huge part of supply chain for software development, about 75 to 80%, right? There is also evidence that attackers try to weaponize these open source tools. I mean, memories of a lot of us having to give up our Thanksgiving vacations last year due to Log4j is still fresh in our minds, right? So in these scenarios, Securing the supply chain is also an important part of the overall security posture. Isn't it only logical that when a large part of supply chain is open source, the software to secure that supply chain is also found in the open source world, right? That is because the community may be able to provide it the scale and breadth that's needed, right? What do you think? Yeah, that that definitely sounds like the way forward. This has been so interesting. Thank you, Kavita and Shyam. Uh, well, uh, I just have one small uh, thing to respond to here, right? Uh, so this has been like, you had asked some really interesting points and Kavita also had brought up some really interesting points around this whole world of open source economics and things like that, right? As I said earlier on, right? We at Deep Friends believe that being innovative within the space of security is the way forward. And not just that, be able to give back to the community because the tools that use the community and not just regular tools, right? A value added tool back to the community is what is going to be uh, what we call as a shared security model, where the community expects certain guarantees from us, the vendors, and we, the vendors, expect and guarantee that we'll play nice with the community. Right? And to that extent, we have some really interesting and cool tools in our GitHub repositories like ThreatNapper, which proposes the idea of a threat graph, a visual representation of things that can go wrong in your infrastructure. So to speak of an MRI for your whole infrastructure is your threat mapper. 
and Threat Striker is the remediation, the enterprise platform that brings about a remediation for all the attacks that might happen and that could happen in their infrastructure. Over to you, Kavita, for some thoughts. Yeah, yeah, um, Shyam, you know, it was a great conversation, great discussion, right? It's it's very uh, interesting to uh, know your perspective. And like you mentioned, right, I mean, you have Threat Mapper, Threat Striker. Um, we at Cox Edge, we have been using, you know, Threat Mapper for some of our application for our infrastructure. It's a, it's a great tool. I would encourage, you know, whoever tuned into this webinar, please go and check out the GitHub repo and take a look at it. A great offering um, and very uh, great, interesting, you know, security tool uh that you should be using awesome all right we did have some questions submitted let's get into them first up i know it's pretty common for for-profit products to get into a new space first and open source alternatives to arrive later we've heard so much about open source today is open source playing much of a role in edge security today what do you think i would say um open source plays critical role. Uh, developers are now getting access to a distributed collaborative environment. There is a shared vision. You see a lot of great tools right now. And, you know, Sham can, um, you know, uh, talk more about those because they are working a lot on these areas and collaboration. Everyone is leveraging the full brain trust of the community. Interesting point, Kavita. So uh, I would say this, right? Edge security or not, slowly and steadily we see a movement towards these open source security tools this naturally as i just said a little while ago right it leads to what we call as a shared security model between the vendors and the community right i mean if you look at it right there is always this table stakes set of actions that any security tool expects to perform that is the whole scanning pieces right and this also forms a part of what we spoke earlier on about this whole software supply chain. That we believe is commodity piece. And so it must be enriched by the community with its infinite wisdom, the breadth, the scope. But we should also provide some value addition there. And that value addition is what we spoke about earlier, where the innovation in terms of being able to add additional context comes into picture that helps you to prioritize all that whole scan results into actionable, meaningful, and a small set of results, right? But the vendor should also provide some minimum guarantees here, which means the vendor should be should not shy away from giving acknowledgments to the tools that they use. We always stand on the shoulders of our giants, and we should never shy from speaking about them and letting them know that we use their tools, right? Mm -hmm. And the tools that we provide should be able to play nice with the whole ecosystem, right? Yep. People who download your tools should see this tool as being able to blend in, to be able to adapt to their existing work, workflow, right? I have this tool and I have that tool. So they should be robust APIs and such. Yeah, those are great points. I think with that, we'll need to wrap up. There are some questions we didn't get to. So watch out for an email soon with a link to this webinar's blog post that will include those questions and answers as well. Uh, we just want to be mindful of everyone's time today. So thank you, Shyam, for being with us today. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Kavita. There were some interesting questions and there's some interesting perspective. I'm going to invite members of this webinar to go over to our github repository check out some of the various tools kavita did speak about packet streamer which is a very interesting tool that we have we do have some other really cool tools uh, packet scanner yara hunter many other open source tools including our flagship offering the threat mapper thank you folks awesome thank you and thank you kavita for helping with this month webinar this month's webinar i think you're back next month right to host yeah, Hannah, I'm back next month. So today we briefly touched upon data. Um, how can we make this data available everywhere, anytime, providing valuable insight? In other words, how the right edge and fast object strategy can supercharge your application. That's the topic for our next month. Awesome. I'm going to tune in. It's going to be interesting. I'm going to tune in for sure. Awesome. It's, it's going to be great. Folks, on the screen, you'll see a link for Deep Fence plus a QR code for Cox Edge. Deep Fence has a great blog post about some of the topics we discussed here today. And at coxedge.com, we have a link to a free developer trial 
So we'll send you an email in a few days with a link to this video and a transcript for this episode. And we hope you'll join us for next month's session too. I'm Hannah. Thank you again to Shyam and Kavita, and we hope to see you next time. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you, everyone.